Good morning. I'm Kelly Kolb, and this is my wife, Jessica, and we want to welcome you to New Life Church. If you're visiting us this morning, we hope you were greeted at the door and picked up some coffee and cookies. We also hope you picked up a Connect card. We also have a QR code you can scan, and this is how we know you're here. If you've missed the QR code, it is posted at the doors outside of the sanctuary. On the back of the card, we have a section for prayer requests. We are a praying church, so if you have any requests, we would love for you to fill this out and drop it in the boxes in the lobby so our members may pray over them. If your request is confidential, please mark it as such, and it will only be shared with the staff. We have several ways to give. If you come prepared to give today, you may place that in the boxes along with your Connect card. You may also mail it, or there is also an online option available. On Sunday, April 21st, we will have an Exploring New Life at the Shakurov's house at 5 p.m. This is the pathway for membership here at New Life. If you have been visiting with us for a while, or even if this is your first time and you would like to learn more about our church or become a member, please contact Misha or Naxana with any questions and to RSVP. We are also happy to announce that the Green family will be with us in less than a month. Please help us welcome the Green family by bringing gift cards to restaurants, grocery stores, or plain Visa gift cards to help with them as they are moving. Lastly, on Sunday, May 5th, after service, New Life will be having a family fun day. There will be jumpers and all sorts of fun for the whole family. If you would like to sign up, please see the kids' ministry booth. Now it is time to invite our kids up to the stage to lead us in a worship song. Come on, kids! Yeah, just chill up here with us. Yeah, y'all can go ahead and come up here. It's still okay. This won't take me very long. Okay, so our pool fundraiser is still happening until May 5th, okay? And so our board out there, you will see amounts like this, and you take an amount off the board, you take an envelope, and you put your money And either by check or cash inside the envelope, you can either give the envelope to um, one of our shepherds or you can um, put it in the the little, what are those boxes called? (laughs) Boxes, no. (laughs) What do we call them out there? What? Contribution boxes. Yeah, sorry, it just left me. The boxes out there, the the boxes with the holes in them. Stick it in there. So (laughs) I put a few today. So um, just a little update. As of Wednesday, we had raised almost $2,000. So yay! I know, $1,925. Yay! We might have a pool for years to come. We do have to raise $50,000 to be able to buy all the things. I know! To buy all the things that we need to do the pool. If you want to know anything about that, that's Thomas and Bud, that's not me. And so um, if you want to give online, you of course can. Um, In Alexio, there's a drop-down menu where you can give online for the pool fundraiser. And so that's an easy way to give too. Okay? All right. So any other questions, you can of course ask us. And there's also um, a little instruction thing over there by the um, pool fundraiser. Okay? All right. Thank you so very much. And let's make our little sloth move all the way up, right? We want him to swim. Every $5,000, we'll raise him up a little bit, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, now y'all can sing. All right, good morning, church. Yeah, hey, good to see all of you back, the ones that left last week uh, to go see the solar eclipse and and stuff. And um, What a week it's been. I mean, for some of us... uh, Anxieties ran high, thinking the world was coming to an end with the solar eclipse and, uh, you know, just all kinds of things. But uh, there's all kinds of anxieties we all have, uh, you know, anxieties about our job and and school and uh, work and uh, our health and just all kinds of things. And... uh, If you carry those anxieties, I'm one of those people, and you're in the right place this morning being here at church. So um, we're fixing to have communion, and uh, this is a time that we get to come and dwell and and, uh, have fellowship with Christ one-on-one. We're going to take of the bread and remember it as being part of his body that was broken for us, and in the cup was his blood that was broken. Uh, shed for us to forgive us of our sin. Um, If I can do this with my iPhone this morning. 
I want to read to you Psalms 91. And talked about anxiety and carrying all kinds of burdens and, and things like that. But Psalm 91 talks about us coming to God with our burdens and finding refuge in Him. And it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you take the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near you, your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I, I, I my prayer is today would be the day, and um, here in just a few minutes, we're going to have prayer couples standing on each side of the stage that'll be happy to pray with you. Uh, if you have any burdens or anxieties that you want somebody to pray with you and, and lift you up in those, do that. But uh, Misha and Oksana will be standing here at the front to serve uh, communion, and there's tables set up on each side uh, that you can have communion with friends and family. and. Just remember that this is your time with God and Jesus. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of him until he comes back. And um, I just pray that we do that this morning. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for the gift of eternal life that you've given us. And Father, I thank you for the gifts of uh, your salvation and, and your refuge to to cover and hide us and protect us from all the evil things of this world, Father, Lord. and um, Father, I just pray uh, this morning that if there's anyone here uh, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, this would be the day, Father. And, and Father, I pray uh, for the message that's to be spoken this morning and just pray for the hearts that we hear what you have us to hear this morning, Father. Lord, lead God and direct us for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ashlyn. <clears throat> Good morning, church. <clears throat> Sounds like some of you know who I am, so that's good, but some of you may not. Uh, my name is Sid Braddock. I'm one of the elders here, and my wife, Krista, and I are part of the shepherding team, and I am not the one that would normally be doing this teaching time if you're visiting, and uh, that's our senior minister, Misha Shakurov, and um, be sure, if this is your first time here, be sure and come back because you're missing out on a very gifted teacher. Uh, God blessed us en enormously bringing Misha here because he just is a, a gifted teacher. And so um, if this is your first time here, be sure and come back and hear uh, the, the lessons that he shares with us. Uh, we do want to welcome you if you're a visitor and um, just hope that you felt welcome and that you uh, somehow this morning are going to be encountered with the God that created the universe. That's our prayer this morning for you. So if you want to mark in your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 17. That's where a passage is coming from. Um, the reason that I'm teaching today is only because Misha asked if I would be willing to do that. And so I said, sure. And uh, 
as, as I've done in the past, then began the process of just trying to decide what is it that I'm supposed to share. And so I've struggled through that process like I normally do, and I, but I feel like I know where God has directed us today, and it's in Acts 17. Uh, a few things first um, that I need to make sure I announce. Communion next week is going to look a little bit different, and we just want you to kind of know that ahead of time. Um, what you're going to find when you come in is some of those prepackaged communion um, packets, and we just want you to be looking for those and make sure you grab one. Misha's lesson is going to be uh, s- kind of centered on communion, and so he'll have more to say about that. I just want you to kind of be thinking about it ahead of time. Um, the next thing, there's, there's a group here in town called the Ernest Cecil Foundation, and, and we're familiar with it because we've talked about it before, uh, but this is a group that is going to be ministering to young ladies under the age of 18 who are rescued from sex trafficking. Okay, so there's a, this is an incredibly powerful ministry that's just getting going, and they're trying to raise funds to, to build their own facility and then to be able to provide all the needs that these young ladies are going to have. And they're doing several different fundraisers this year. The, the one that's coming up most immediately is this coming Saturday, and it's just a, it's a fun run just to raise some money, and it's happening on the UTPB campus. And so that slide gives you uh, some information about that. If you're if you want to know more about it, if you're interested in participating, you can certainly come and ask me. I've got some information. And then in the next few weeks, we'll have Sandra White um, give us some other announcements about some other ways that we can help with fundraising with that organization because um, they're doing a few other things. But uh, this is an incredibly important ministry that this group is doing, and we just want to keep that in your thoughts. We want you to uh, continue to pray for that group. Um, Listen, if you are a, I don't know, college kid, or if you're a young single adult in your 20s, and you just haven't really gotten a place to plug in yet here at New Life, I just want you to know we, we've got a group that we started meeting with in early February. Krista and I are doing that now. And if we've somehow missed you in the process of reaching out to people that would really fit into that category, come talk to me or Krista. Uh, and we'll, we'll get you plugged in if it's the right fit for you. Um, it's just we're really getting, we're enjoying getting to know these kids and, and uh, have a, providing a place of community for them. So um, just come holler at us if you're curious about that. Now, every time I speak, I, I start a little light because um, I can share things that I wouldn't get to share otherwise publicly, and, and uh, sometimes I should ask permission before, but... Um, I haven't historically done that, and I didn't do that this time either. But let me, let me preface this by saying I love my wife. Um, and, and I'm not, like, she's the person that brings fun and positivity to, to our life. And so I'm not just saying that because I'm about to say something that might make her mad at me. I'm, I'm saying it because it's the truth. Um, but I want to share some, just, to, just some things about her that I think you, you would find Uh, entertaining. This is just going to be real quick. It's not connected to the lesson at all. Um, She, uh, she's had a knack her whole life of developing new words, um, new vocabulary that she didn't really intend to to develop, but she's done it. And it's usually pretty close to, to spot on to what she's really trying to communicate. And I just want to share a few of those with you. There's a bunch, but I'm going to share three of them with you. Um, so we were driving to Rio Dosa one time, and as you get into the mountains, you start seeing these signs, and they're telling you what's about to happen with the road, and we see this sign that, you know, does this, and then, you know, so it's telling you there's going to be a sharp turn, and you're going to be coming back the same direction. She says, oh, this is one of those hairball curves. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, I think I know what she meant. She meant hairpin. <laughs> she meant hairpin. Maybe she meant curveball. I don't know. But she managed to... I knew what she was talking about. So, we, so also, we've, we've, in the past, we played the, uh, the Monopoly game. I think it, maybe Albertsons was doing it, or maybe it was Market Street. I can't remember when, but, but they were doing this Monopoly game where you go and you, you buy groceries, and you get these little uh, pieces to, to try to win things on the Monopoly board. And um, we were getting pretty close, at least she thought we were. And there was a couple of pieces we didn't have that everyone else in the whole world didn't have, but she was thinking we were going to get them. 
And she says, if we get these two pieces, we are going to win the jack prize. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's jackpot, grand prize, put them together, that works. All right, and then this one, this one, I wasn't really sure what to think about this one. I, we, she's a teacher, and so we were talking one day about just stuff related to the district. And I, I said, what? So my question was, what happens, like, what's the punishment for kids that um, get caught smoking weed? And she said, well, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure they get dismembered. <laughs> and I, I thought, I thought, oh, man, that's harsh. That is a, that's a rough punishment. So somehow she went from expelled to dismembered, and I guess our, our kids are glad she's not right. But um, anyway, you, you should have conversations with her. You'll learn all kinds of new words. Um, so let me, but let's, before we shift gears into, into the seriousness here, I want to make sure we pray. And I'm going to make sure that we pray, that we include a, in my prayer uh, what's happening in Israel there is real tension that's developing uh, in the last few days, uh, and, and we need God's protection um, over the minds that are making some decisions right now. So let's pray together. Father, I just I pray your blessing over uh, those that make decisions regarding world peace and, and conflict. We just ask for wisdom to prevail, uh, for love of humanity to prevail. And this morning, God, I ask you to speak through me. I ask that this, this lesson that's prepared is, is exactly right for at least one person in this room. And I ask you to just to, uh, move me to the side and say what you want to say in these next few minutes. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So again, our passage is in Acts 17. It's verse 16 through 34. Um, I'm, I'm a geek, sort of a geek for context and background, historical information, all that stuff that would add to what we understand in Scripture. And so my instinct is to share all that, but we don't have an hour and a half for me to do that, so, so I'm not going to do that to you. But I do want you to understand this. Um, if you get nothing else from what we talk about today in this passage, you can always go back to this section of Scripture if you want sort of a blueprint for what the Christian life should, should entail. Because what we're going to see in the, in the passage is that Paul knows how to love God and he knows how to love people, and then he has no problem sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. Okay, And this section of Scripture lays it all out for you. And so uh, that's a good place to go if you want to understand what you're supposed to be about. Um, I would emphasize that um, sharing the truth or sharing the good news should always come from this place, yeah? Um, it's the source of truth. People's opinions are not sources of truth automatically, and there's 8 billion different opinions on this planet, and so I would encourage us to remember to always go back to the Word as our source of truth. Um, I want to give you some context about what we're about to read. Paul has just been run out of two different towns for sharing uh, the news of Christ. Two different places, they just said, nope, we don't want you here, and so he had to, he had to move on, and the, the fellow believers sent him to a city called Athens, and that's where we're going to pick up um, the reading. This is a lengthy reading. I, just want to, I, I reassure you I'm not going to try to go through each verse and pick it apart, but I want us to read the entire passage together. This is Acts 17, verses 16 through 34 from the CSB uh, translation. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now, Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar 
on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nation of men to live all over the earth, and he has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live, so that they might seek God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring." Being God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. And therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about resurrection of the dead... Some began to ridicule him, but others said, We will hear you about this again. So Paul went out from their presence. However, some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now, there are several things that we just we cannot ignore in this passage. But then there's also a really a, kind of a main point, and that main point, I'll explain in a few minutes, came out of my own personal, uh, I guess what you'd call wrestling with God over something. First, we want to notice that Paul um, recognizes the lost nature of Athens. So one of the first things we read, he comes in and he's like, well, there's, these people are obsessed with idols and they're, they're all about the mind and the intellect and sharing their thoughts and their opinions on things. And for him, that just means these, these people don't really know who God is. They don't understand that all the answers are there for us. And he, can't, he just simply cannot be quiet about God and Jesus. He's not going to sit and, and wait um, for, for uh, what we found earlier, that Timothy and Silas, who were going to come and, and join him there, he's not going to wait on them to start his ministry in Athens. And in this process, he just simply, uh, with his heart for the people around him, God works through that process, and he, he gives him this opportunity to speak on the biggest stage in Athens. The Areopagus was sort of like, it's where they held uh, trials, it's where they uh, had all their big debates, and their, the brightest minds got to come and just sort of tell what they thought about things. And so in this process of just sharing Jesus in the community, God creates the circumstance where he gets to have the biggest stage in the city to share the good news. So the next thing we see is that in that opportunity, Paul just simply shares what he knows to be true. Now, I can, you can read the, all of that again. I choose to look at it and say, you know, how would I say this? What, how would I simplify this and, and put it in the words that, that I, would, I would use to share this with people? And this is, this is my gross oversimplification of, of what I think Paul said here. <clears throat> There's one and only one God. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. We only exist because of him. He knows each person on a very intimate level and actively pursues a personal relationship with each one of us. That relationship is only possible because of the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Turn away from your sinful life and submit to his control because that's where a fulfilled life is found. The opportunity to do that won't always be available. Now, this is a message that every person in the world desperately needs to hear. And the truth is that we are actually the ones to share it. Um, Paul did his part and in this day and time now, it's our, it's our responsibility to share this message. And before we get to, to really kind of the main thing that I was mentioning earlier, don't miss right at the end of the passage that Paul 
was able to share the message and then move forward. And then he just kind of is leaving it in God's hands. It's like God, God's the one that's got to do, do the work after we've been willing to share. And we see in the text that some, some ridiculed, uh, some sort of pondered it and wanted to try to understand it better. Others just flat out believed. You know, they accepted the message and believed. And that can be the way that it's received for us too in the times that we decide that we're going to share. And I'm going to give you something for free here. Um, in, my, in my research, this man that's mentioned Dionysius, his histor- historical records indicate that he was a really well-respected philosopher there in Athens. Um, and he believed, he became the leader of the Athens church, and, or one of the leaders, and in that process, he became pretty close friends with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he was so close with her, in fact, that he was there when she passed away. That's what the historical records tell us. If you will dig into to Scripture, God will, God will show you things, and he'll, he'll lead you places that you don't realize the Scripture can take you. Um, so that's free. That wasn't even really... <laughs> Um, so here's the thing that I want to emphasize the very most about description, and, and surprisingly, it's just a very simple phrase. But the reason that I feel like I have to share it is because um, I, for about the past two years, I have walked in extreme frustration and fatigue, and um, I would say it's borderline anger at times with the situation that I walk in at work. It has nothing to do with the people that I work with, because I'm a physical therapist, it has nothing to do with my coworkers, has nothing to do with my boss. It has to do with the nature of the job that I have, okay? Um, it's, I walk in the door and it's just, it feels nonstop, very mentally draining from the time I get there till the time I leave. And, and so it feels like there's not time for me to do anything but just do what I do. And I don't even think I can establish relationships with the people around me enough to share Christ. That was, that was the, that's what I convinced myself of, okay? And then I started, I watched a few sermons, and then I started, you know, in the process of reading Scripture. It's like I, there's this repeated message that that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. You, you can reach people around you no matter how stressful things are. You can, you can do this. And so I've been, a, I guess, a work in progress over the past year, year and a half, trying to be a different person, specifically at my workplace. And, and I'm so far away from where I know I, I should end up, but it's something that God at least made me aware of. And so somehow this is captured in one small sentence in this passage. It's in verse 26. Okay, It says, From one man he has made every nation of men to live all over the earth, and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. So I want to make sure you hear that. He's, de- he's determined. He has made every nation of men to live all over the earth. And has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. So God decided ahead of time that this is going to be our time and our place. Like... We don't get to choose a different time and place. This is, this is the time he gave us. And um, we're perfectly capable of dealing with the, now, the here and now that we live in. Um, Paul told us there in verse 24 that God made the world and everything in it. That includes us. He told us in verse 28 that we live, move, and exist in him. So he absolutely knows what we're capable of. And this isn't the only place in Scripture we're going to see this idea. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16 says it this way. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. And then we see in Ephesians 2.10 where it says this, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So God knit you together, and he knew what every single day of your life would bring. And he knows that you're exactly right for this time and this place. So if we can believe, if we can believe Scripture and what it says about us, that we're divinely appointed for, for, for here and now, the question is, do we understand what our here and now looks like? Um, I think we do. Because we have to live in it, we have to walk in it, and, and we all experience um, the brokenness that seems to be really obvious around us. But let's make sure that we understand a few things just in case uh, we're kind of numb to all of it. I, I got some t- t- statistics here from the several different sources. First one, National Institutes, uh, the Institute of Health. Uh, these are just a couple of st- statistics about uh, suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among youths. And it accounts for 57% of all violent deaths. Suicide rates increased by 30%. This is over the last two or three years. Suicide's rate, suicide rates increased by 30% in 44 of 50 states across every age group. And the most dramatic increases occurred in men aged 45 to 64. Pew Research Center uh, does uh, a survey every few years where they're just trying to get a feel for what's the mental and emotional state of our country. And one of the most recent uh, surveys that they did, these are some of the statistics that they found. 41% of adults report higher levels of psychological distress in the past two to three years. Over one-third of high school students report living with mental health challenges. That's one in three of our teens. And they recognize that they have mental health challenges. And then it says, and then, and then 44% of teens, almost half, 44% of teens report feeling, quote, persistent sadness or hopelessness. And what they do with the Pew Research Center is, is they, they ask all these questions and then they come up with sort of a summary statement where they're like, this is what we think we're seeing here. I'm just going to read you part of this summary statement. It says, There is a growing overall prevalence of inappropriate, intense, and poorly controlled anger in the U.S. population. Anger was especially common among men and younger adults and is often associated with decreased psychosocial functioning. There are fewer friendships and a lack of connections, meaning, and purpose. People feel unseen, and this has created a culture of emptiness. So, so these, th- these statistics are just kind of a small snapshot of, of what the people around us and even us in this room are dealing with day in and day out. But there's also information out there about what's the health of our church right now. Like what, what's, what, are our, what are people that identify as, as Christians thinking about? And what is it that they're um, kind of where is their mind right now related to even just th- theological beliefs. There's a, there's a group called Ligonier Ministries, and they, they do their own survey every few years. And so I'm going to share with you some statements that they gave the people that participated in their survey. And the only people that they allow to participate in the survey are people that say that they are evangelical Christians. So they identify as evangelical Christians. These are the statements, and, and I'll tell you how the responses were. The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. 53% agreed with that. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 44% agreed with that. The Holy Spirit is a force, but not a personal being. 55% agreed with that. God accepts the worship of all religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 58% agreed with that. And this last one. Religious belief is a matter of personal opinion and is not tied to objective truth. 38% agreed with those statements, or with, the, with that statement. So, 
I think it's clear we live in a world of confusion, frustration, both inside and outside the church. But sometimes statistics don't give us the full picture if we're trying to understand our here and now. And so we're going to try a little bit of a visual check here. And um, what I'd ask you to do is pay attention to the emotions that you feel when we look at these pictures. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about how this ties to what we're discussing. So let me, let's see that first picture. We're just going to look at these for a second. Okay, let's, let's go to the next one. And then the next one. Okay, and then the next one. Okay. And then the next one. Okay. I think there's one more. Okay, I didn't give you very long on each one of those. Um, you can sit and look at those, and there's all kinds of, I know there's all kinds of opinions that, that pop into your head right away. I went through the process of picking these, choosing these pictures with Krista, and I found myself getting triggered, and she starts hearing what I think about this and that, and she's like, oh, we're, what are we, what's going on? We're just trying to pick photos for you to use, you know, I, and... So I understand the reaction that some, and these, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that all these are bad things. I'm just saying we are kind of intense and, and heightened in our responses to almost everything right now. And a lot of times it has to do with our opinions and what we think is right and what we think is wrong. And yes, a lot of times that's informed by scripture, which it should be. And so I understand that dynamic. But I'm more interested in the emotions that are stirred up in us related to people in general. Just can we move from opinions and uh, irritations to a place of love and compassion? Can we do that in our heart um, for those that we find instinctively difficult to tolerate? We can see in Paul's actions in this passage um, that, that that right heart places in us in the best circumstance to share the message. And so I think it's important that we, that we think about that. You know, as bizarre and twisted and frustrating as the world is, um, again, we are wired to effectively manage what we're dealing with right now. Um, and, and we don't have to just try to get by or insulate ourselves in, in frustration and anger. And, and this responsibility to share the good news, um, it hasn't been put on hold until things get more normal. You know, I don't know that we're going back to what we would consider normal. <clears throat> so if we can buy into the idea that we're, we are uniquely kind of wired and placed for right now, that there's something God put in us that we can handle, we can handle all this around us that we're dealing with, and, and we can actually, in the middle of all that, we can actually share the good news. If we believe that that's true, what are the things that would stop us? That would stop us from going ahead and doing that? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge those things. There's a lot of different things that would stop us from carrying out what God has asked us to do, which is to share the good news. But these are a few of the things that I've, that I've thought of um, because they were sort of my reasons for not wanting to do this. Um, maybe it's the idea that you're too broken for God to use you. I don't know what your past is. Maybe there's something there and you're like, you know, that just sort of disqualifies me. Um, here's, here's my encouragement. If you read the Bible, um, God has a long track record of using broken people to, uh, to do his work. And uh, David, King David, man after God's own heart. Well, yeah, he was an adulterer and a murderer. Um, Moses, he, he led the, God's people out of the promised land. Well, he was also a murderer. He was also a bit of a coward. 
at times, and then he was also pretty defiant. Uh, he worked through a lady named Rahab. She's a prostitute. Even Paul, right here in this passage, I mean, he was one of the original persecutor of Christians, yet God worked mightily through him. So I would ask you to let go of that feeling that there's something about you that just isn't usable, uh, or it's just, it's just too gross, because that's not, the, that's, that's not what we see from God. Uh, you can't out his grace if you'll just accept it. Um, if you think about these people I just mentioned, we wouldn't allow any of those people on our staff here, I'm betting. You know, sorry, you, you seem like a great person, but you, uh, you killed a guy. So we're not going to let you teach our kids. You know, I mean, those, that's the truth, and there's wisdom in that. But that's, we have to change our thinking about what God can do, who he can work through, who he chooses to use. All right? Because he's about reaching people. And so... Um, Maybe, maybe there's a hesitation about sharing Christ because this Christian badge seems a little, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe right now there's so much confusion and so much disagreement within the church that we don't really trust um, the credibility of that label of, of, of Christian. I would tell you this, the responsibility, responsibility still falls on us to lean on the Holy Spirit for discernment. And be willing to point people to Jesus. Um, that is a personal thing that we have to uh, understand. And as long as we're doing it firmly grounded in the truth of Scripture, then we can leave it in God's hands just the way Paul did. Maybe we've become satisfied with what I would call lesser loves. Um, these are often kind of what we would think as morally neutral things that we can pour our energy and our... Um, and our time into just trying to get some sort of temporary satisfaction or just something to numb us and uh, take, take the cares away for a few minutes. They occupy our time and attention. And really what they're doing is they're just stealing opportunities for us to grow closer to Christ. I mean, think of things like Netflix or uh, social media and the time that, that, that we can spend just, just looking. And I just... I just think it's important for us to recognize some of these things that, that we allow to occupy the time and space in our lives when really uh, there are different ways that we can choose to spend that time. And the challenge is to recognize those lesser loves and then pray for the ability to set them aside more and more often. Just, I'm going to do something different with my time today. So it's a really big deal that we're the ones who know the truth about the creator of the universe and his son, Jesus. And um, we've been uniquely wired and placed in this in where we are right now, in this time in history. And the, the temptation is, because we have a place like this, this is an incredible, um, like most other churches, it's an incredible place to belong to. I mean, we can come here and be, we can be encouraged. Uh, we can be built up. We can learn scriptural truth. Uh, we can worship the Savior that we know. And, and then we can very easily say, Misha and Erica, they can reach people for the lost on Sundays. And then we can walk out of this place and sort of just live our life and maybe not think about it nearly as much as we should. So that's the question. What do we do outside of this place in these day-to-day -day dealings with, with the here and now that we live in? I would encourage you to ask God to move in your life, in the places that you work, in the neighborhoods you live in, the areas of influ influence that you walk in, Ask him to move in your life in a way that creates opportunities to share the good news. He, he will do that. In my own experience, when I finally started trying to step out of my own frustrations 
and pay attention to the people around me. Um, it wasn't like I became some uh, crazy evangelist and I started telling everyone I came across about Jesus. That wasn't, that's not the way it's happening for me. He's, he's forcing me to create relationships with the people around me. And then there are, there are opportunities now that are coming up where I'm actually able to talk about Jesus. And I, I think that only comes because you, you pray and you're asking God, do that in my life. Help me, help me be more about you and less about me. So I encourage you, pray, pray for those opportunities and then watch for what he puts in front of you. He wants to reach the lost and he's asked us to join him in that work. I appreciate you letting me share, share this message with you today. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up, and then we're going to have the worship team come up here and lead us in a song, but we're going to pray as they get set up. Father, thank you for today and the, uh, just those that decided to be here. I pray that you're working in their lives, um, that you would continue to place people in their paths that bring you closer and closer into their hearts and into their minds. And um, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the things that it teaches us. We're thankful for um, being able to, to go look at a section of scripture and see exactly how someone who loves you would behave somehow, some, some, someone who loves you, what they would do and how they would share the good news about your son. Help us to have the courage to examine ourselves and do the same. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.